thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your word. Lord, we pray that our hearts would be open and attentive to you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Got your Bibles. Today, we will begin in Luke chapter 10, um, and we will centre around the Gospel of Luke and finish up a bit further on. Today, we continue our series, The Root of the Righteous, which is speaking about a inner life which supports our outer life. And it may seem confusing that rest would be one of those. But when we say the word rest, I wonder what we think of what that means in our lives. What did Jesus mean when he used the word rest? And does this apply to us? And you might find some surprises today. Uh, Most people will know uh, or may know that I'm a forensic science nut. (laughs) Sounds kind of macabre, but I love the fact that uh, two people can walk into a crime scene know absolutely nothing of what has taken place and by deduction and evidence be able to piece together a story and put people into the crime scene. And I I love it because when we take those principles and apply them to the universe, God's fingerprints and God's DNA is everywhere, including inside of each and every one of us. But one of the cases that I uh, really enjoyed was a, a guy by the name of Joseph Crater. Joseph Crater was a guy that lived in about the 1930s and he was a New York Supreme Court Justice. He was a pretty high up kind of guy and uh, Joseph Crater went out for a meal with his friends. He enjoyed a great night out. He hailed a taxi and nobody ever seen or heard of him again. Now he was one judge that was very adamant about putting people from the Mafia away, so the FBI immediately suspected Mafia links, but there was no evidence for that, and all of those uh, investigations went nowhere. Then they thought, well, maybe it was foul play, and they had a look at his circle of friends, and they couldn't find anything. One piece of evidence. Nobody, no nothing. One piece of evidence that was left. When Mrs Crater got home, there was a cheque made out to her on the table with a note. And all the note said is, I am very, very, very tired. Love, Joe. That's all the evidence they had. We don't know what happened to Joe. But I wonder today how many of us have had moments in our lives, or maybe we feel today, like writing that note. I am very, very, very tired and I just want to disappear. Maybe that's some of us. I've got some good news this morning. Jesus came to give us rest. Jesus came to remove yokes off our lives. Jesus came to bring us freedom. Jesus says in Matthew 11, verse 28, Jesus says, Come unto me, all you who are heavy laden or labouring, weary and heavy laden. What did Jesus mean by that? And he says, I will give you rest. Jesus goes on and says, take my yoke upon you because it's easy. What was Jesus talking about? This morning, as we begin our journey and having a look at rest, maybe what we should first cover off is what did Jesus mean by weary and labouring and what did he mean by heavy laden? And I wonder whether this may apply to us today or maybe throughout our Christian walk. Uh, The weariness that is spoken of here, that Jesus uses the word weary there, speaks more about a physical and an emotional weariness. Uh, It's kind of the best way to describe this weariness is a fighter who has been beaten up and he is completely and utterly weary. I wonder whether anybody in this room has had moments and seasons in their life where you feel like life has beaten you up, where you feel like a certain amount of circumstances have beaten you. Maybe that's you here today. Uh, Moving further on, Jesus says those that are heavy laden. And I do believe that there are Christians that are carrying yokes that you don't have to. 
When Jesus says heavy laden, he's speaking more about our spiritual condition. He's speaking more about the fact that uh, we often carry yokes of sin and guilt and shame and uh, maybe we carry yokes of bitterness and unforgiveness and resentment and offence. Maybe we're carrying yokes that Jesus came to set us free from. And today I hope what we understand is the rest that Jesus is promising is less uh, having a break and, and working on your tan and sipping Mai Tai somewhere. It's got a lot more to do with the posture of life. Let me try to clarify what I mean. How does a man sleep in the front of a boat when it's about to be swamped? Jesus came to save the world, but he walked everywhere. He was never in a hurry. If you read the Gospels, people were never an interruption to Jesus. They were always an opportunity. One example is blind Bartimaeus. We know the Gospels tell us that Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem and everything that Jesus is going to Jerusalem for is time sensitive. I need to be there at a certain time. But as he's leaving Jericho, a blind man starts crying out to him. Jesus doesn't say, I don't have the time. Jesus doesn't say, I'll have to schedule you in next week. Jesus says, bring him here. Nobody was ever an interruption to Jesus. He had a posture of life. But let's, let's step outside of Christ for a moment. And let's have a look at the apostles. Herod has just killed James. Not the half-brother of Jesus, James the brother of John. Herod has just killed him with the sword and it pleased the crowd so much that Herod locks up Peter with the intentions of doing away with him tomorrow. Peter is so sound asleep in the jail that angels got to nudge him to wake him up. What? How many, of us would be, how many of us would be looking for cracks in the wall to get out? How many of us are thinking Shawshank Redemption? What about, what about Paul? On his way to Rome. Now, here's a guy that knew that God had called him to go to Rome. On his way, by the way, he suffers four shipwrecks. How many, people would, how many people today would say, that's God telling me I'm not going to Rome? Not Paul. And one of those shipwrecks, he finds himself on the Isle of Malta. And he's cold. It's close to Tassie. <laughs> so Paul decides, I'll light a fire. And when he puts the wood on the fire, a viper comes out of the wood and grabs hold of his hand and bites him. All of the natives are waiting for him to blow up like a puffer fish. And what Paul does is not so profound as what he doesn't do. He shakes the viper off. He doesn't call the elders. He doesn't tell them to bring a flask of oil with them. He doesn't hold a prayer meeting. He shakes the viper off and goes about his business. Because he had an inner posture of life that knew... God's got me. Peter knew in that jail cell, if I die tomorrow, it's God's will. Peter knew that we're all in God's hands, but how many of us would be wrestling? How many of us, if I, how many of us don't even like the sight of snakes, let alone if one jumps out of the, out of the wood and, and bites us? Cheryl <laughs> won't sleep for three weeks just because of the fact that I mentioned a viper this morning. The question today is, what did Jesus mean by rest fully and how can we bring that into our lives? And I want to finish with three C's to bring that into our own lives. But what did Jesus mean by rest? That word rest there means restoration or to be reinvigorated. How many people here this morning are going, that's me, 2024, I need to get me some of that. Well, the good news is you can live a life of posture in that place. A life completely refreshed and replenished. It's a challenge that is before us all. But what Jesus meant, we often get rest around the wrong way. We think that rest is what we do after work. So we think we work, 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 work. Then the weekend comes and we rest. But that's not the biblical principle of rest. The biblical guide for rest is we rest first, then we work. 
we work from rest. The whole idea behind the Sabbath was this. The whole idea was take time before you even start. Take time to centre your life on me. You're going to get distracted. You're going to be overcome with the affairs of this life. And I want you to keep this space in your calendar every week. And Sabbath is actually something that is more about every day uh, as well as every week. I want you to keep this space in your calendar just to do nothing else except to focus on me. Today as we stand here, I want you to know the day of the week is not important. What is important is that we each have a posture in our own lives where we put God first and then we work. That's the idea. The word that Jesus uses for rest can also mean spiritual restoration and revival. And how many people here today are saying, I need to get me some of that, Pastor? How can I do that? Uh, The interesting thing is God models uh, the rest for us. Remember... Uh, remember God worked six days, he, he created, he made, he fashioned, he formed, then it says he rested and what God did was he rested in his completed work. Today, I may as well tell you now because the whole point is this, Jesus is your rest. We rest in his completed work. Let me take an analogy before we move into the three C's. Uh, Hebrews speaks about... Hebrews speaks about the Israelites, and we all know the story of the Israelites. The Israelites embarked on a 40-day journey that would take them over 40 years. They were on their way to the promised land. Many people will know that, and we know how that land is built up. It's the promised land. It's the land flowing with milk and honey. This is the land that God had called for. Now, God didn't need them to go and to get a victory. God was asking them to possess the land. How many people know that when Israel crossed the Jordan, that's when their battles began? But something was different. They weren't fighting in their power and in their strength. God was winning their victories. Jericho was a formidable city. And the walls came down and the city was overthrown because they walked around praising God. God is the victory. And in the Christian life, Jesus is our rest. Why? Because we don't come into a whole list of things we have to do. We come into everything that Christ has done. The the Christian life is a journey to possess the land that Christ has marked out for you. Salvation and adoption and... And all these wonderful things that lie for us in the promised land. But we have to fight not to gain a victory. We fight to enforce the victory of Christ. So how is it that we can enter this rest? How can we begin to put... I want to give you three C's today. We're going to look at a couple of examples of what rest is not as well as what rest actually looks like. If you've got your Bibles, you've began in Luke 10. We will begin in verse 38. Everybody knows the story of Martha and Mary. Verse 38, now as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. A bit of a side note, Jesus never came alone. This isn't Martha welcoming just Jesus. This is Jesus, the disciples, a whole lot of hanger honorers, And it was customary in the first century as the host, if you're welcoming somebody, that you would expend your efforts and resources to be a good host and prepare a meal for them. So Martha's not necessarily doing anything wrong. <clears throat> Verse 39, and she had a sister called Mary. What's Mary doing? Mary sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. Let's learn a little bit more about Martha as we work our way through these passages. Uh, Ask yourself the question this morning, am I Martha or am I Mary? Many of us here are busy about good things. Uh, uh, What Mary is doing in and of itself is not intrinsically sinful, but the fact of the matter is when the Son of God's in the house, some things can wait. 
And she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching, but Martha was distracted uh with much serving. She was distracted with much serving. And she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. What's Martha saying? What's your gig, Mary? I'm out here slaving in the kitchen. You could at least come out and give me a little bit of a hand. The kale's burnt. The sausages are ready. I love Jesus' answer. We can all be busy about good things. We all have responsibilities. I get that. We all have responsibilities. We all have work. We all have, uh, we all have family. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and you are troubled about many things. You are anxious and you are troubled. Anxiety and worry and fear will rob you of your rest. Martha, you are worried about many things. Your focus and your attention is on many other things. What did Jesus say about Mary? She has chosen the one thing. And it will not be taken away from her. The first seed this morning is come to Jesus. Uh, Mark Connor writes a book. Mark Connor's, uh, Mark Connor's been here to speak before. But Mark Connor writes a book called Avoiding Burnout. And in that book, he urges everybody to institute uh, in their life a thing called retreating. Now, if I say to everybody here, uh, let's go on a retreat, uh, most people will have an idea of what that might mean. We're, we're going to go up into the hills somewhere. We're going to go away from everybody else. We're going to go away on our own. We're going to go where there's no cell phone, there's no emails, there's no phone calls. We're going to go out where only you can only hear the birds sing and the cats squeal. That's the only things we want to hear. We're going to go away. That's what we think when we think of retreat. And there's nothing wrong with that. I'm just asking everybody to build that into your everyday life. One hour a day, turn the phone off, turn the computer off. Jesus modelled this. Jesus was constantly surrounded by crowds. Jesus was constantly barraged by criticism. But how often do we read in the Gospels that he went away to a desolate place by himself to pray? We need to find that closet. We need to find that place that Mary found, which is right at the feet of Christ. Have a look at what Mary's doing. She hasn't got her prayer list out. She's not working from the top down. She, she is sitting and she is listening. She is sitting and enjoying the presence of Jesus and she is just listening. I would encourage everybody, number one, how do we adopt a posture of rest in our lives? It begins by coming to Christ. It begins by setting aside the things of this world. You might have to get up earlier. You might be a night owl and you might stay up later. Whatever you have to do to find that place. Uh, Susanna Wesley, for those who know the story of John and Susanna Wesley. Susanna Wesley had 13 children. God bless their cotton socks. And she had a system where she would sit down on a stool and lift her dress up over her head and everybody in the house knew, you don't talk to mum then. Sounds really strange, sounds really weird, but underneath there, she would be reading the word and pro- that was her time. You, don't talk when, you can't get anything out of mum then. I'm sure we can find more civilised ways. First C is to come. Second one is if we flip the page... We're going to have a look at a parable that Jesus talks about, which is actually false rest. Often, you will rest in what is your security and where we find our security. There is a deep intrinsic need inside of every one of us to know security and to be secure. And so we have systems, uh, particularly in Western culture, we have systems and we have metrics by which we measure security. None of them wrong in of themselves, but have a listen to this parable. This is a somewhat haunting parable uh, to the Western culture. Uh, 
flipping the page to chapter 12, we'll start at verse 13. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who made me a judge or an arbitrator over you? Moving into the parable, Jesus says, Take care and be on guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. We're now going to have a look at what false rest looks like. He told them a parable saying the land of a rich man produced plentifully. So this guy's going okay, things are going all right for him. There is nothing wrong with your land producing plentifully. Nothing wrong at all. Verse 17, and he thought to himself, sometimes this is where we go wrong. He thought or he reasoned, that word means, to himself. What sh- As we read these verses, I wonder how many times you can highlight the word I or my. Have a listen to this. What shall I do, for I have nowhere to store my crops? And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and all my goods. And I will say to my soul, (laughs) I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for you for many years. Relax. Rest. Take it easy. She's all good, champ. The barns are full. Maybe today it would sound like this. Take it easy. Superannuation's going well. Bank accounts are full. All is going well. I don't want to be macabre this morning, but your bank accounts can be full. You could have the largest house and you can still drop dead tomorrow. Good morning and welcome to you too. But that's exactly what Jesus is trying to teach us in this parable because he goes on and he uses a really haunting word here. Have a a listen, see if we can pick it up. Verse 19, and I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. Verse 20, but God said to him, fool. That's a really haunting word, that one. This night your soul is required of you. That word required speaks of a lender coming back to take possession of what he has leased you. The mistake this guy made was, he says, I will build, I will have larger barns, I have done this, and he fails to realise the life you have and the oxygen you breathe is leased to you from the almighty God, and he will take it back when he is ready. False rest looks like I will make myself secure. I will rest in the work of my hands. I can make myself righteous. Have a listen to the Pharisees that are behind even this parable. I will make myself righteous. I will reach God. I will get my own way into heaven. And what we see here is a complete false rest. But Jesus goes on, we're required of you, and these things you have prepared, whose will they be? And uh, I've got some good news for you. If you fast forward 100 years from now and you are able to come back, if you are able to time travel right now to 100 years in the future, here's something I want you to know. Somebody else is living in your house. The messages aren't always this macabre, by the way, so if you're new here this morning, a very warm welcome. But 100 years from now, somebody else is living in your house and probably not driving your car, and if it's a Holden, then they're not driving your car. It doesn't last that long. (laughs) Good morning, Michael. (laughs) False rest. And you can't take any of it with you. The mistake he made was you should be invested into the future. Jesus goes on and helps us to understand how we can begin to build a posture. We're worried about the things of life. Have I got enough money to retire? Am I, uh, the cost of living is going up. And uh, we, we look for security in many places. We become anxious and worried about many things. Maybe today, maybe, maybe we're worried about our health. And it's good to go to the doctors and all those sorts of things. But they aren't the ultimate answer. Jesus says, verse 22 of chapter 12, I love these words. I wonder how many of us this will apply to today. Therefore, which is Jesus speaking back to the parable that he's just told us. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. 
What Jesus is saying is don't be anxious. Don't be worried about your life. Don't be worried about these things. We should be diligent. We should be wise, yes. But don't let these things take your focus or your attention. Do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, nor about your body, what you will put on. For life is more than food. And my three boys are going, "Uh -uh." (laughs) uh-uh. For life is more than food and the body more than clothing. What do we do? The second C is the word consider. First one is come. The second one is consider. Here's what Jesus says to those that are worried today. Here's what Jesus says to those that might be feeling insecure today. Here's what Jesus says to those and to the rich people or the rich fools maybe. Maybe that could apply to anybody in this room. But here's what Jesus would say. Your security doesn't lie in those things. You don't need to fret. You don't need to worry. Why? Consider. Consider what? The word consider means to change your focus, to turn your energy, your focus and attention to. Consider God. Consider his faithfulness. Consider the fact that two, you can read other, uh, this is in Matthew as well. Consider the fact that two sparrows are sold for a penny, but not one of them falls to the ground without my father knowing. Consider the fact that lilies, they don't toil or spin, they don't work or anything like that, but when they flower, they are dressed in more glory and garb than Solomon. Why do we fret? Why do we worry? I get emails all the time. You say anything about the book of Revelation and you're going to get some emails. I get get emails all the time. Have you seen this? This is what's going on. You know what? Those things might be going on and they may mean a million different things. But you know what? God's in control. I've read the end of the book, Billy Graham said. It's all going to be okay. We should read books from the back to the front. Life has its challenges, yes. You might have financial challenges, you might have health challenges, you might have relationship challenges, yes, 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 yes and yes. But here's what I do know, God is still seated on the throne. The wars are breaking out in the Middle East, yes. Please point back to a point in history, just out of interest. Please tell me in the last 2,000 years when the Middle East has had complete and utter rest. You will not have rest in the Middle East and in Israel until it's one state. While there is a line driven up the middle, you will not have rest. Wars, rumours of wars, yes, but God hasn't moved off the throne. Consider, take a moment... Maybe next time you hear the news headlines. Maybe next time you get the financial statement from the bank. Maybe the next time you're sitting in front of the doctor and he says, we need to talk. Maybe just consider, how many times has God held you in the past? How many times have you been to these situations and you thought the world was going to spin off its axis, but God held you? Number one is come to Christ. The second one is consider. This morning I want to finish with the third C. This is, this is at the top of my prayer list this year. Because what Paul unpacks in Philippians chapter 4, I think is profound. The last C is the word content. Paul, uh, I, I want to talk about a verse that we all know. How many people here have heard the verse, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me? Yeah. Great verse, right? Today, I want to give you the context of that verse. It may not mean what you think it means. Because here's what Paul is saying. Philippians chapter 4, we begin at verse 10. He says, I rejoice in the Lord greatly. Uh, By the way, Philippians is the only epistle Paul writes without a rebuke. It's all encouraging. So if you feel like an encouragement or a lift, read Philippians. Uh, I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned, speaking about monetary support for him in his ministry. That's what he's talking about. Uh, You were concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Verse 11. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. 
You could remove a thousand worries out of your life today if you were just content with what God had placed in your lap. If you're just content with where you are. What Paul is saying, Paul, according, apart from Christ, he's one of the most faith-filled men. This guy's not lacking any faith. But he says, I have seasons in my life when I have next to nothing. And I've also known seasons in my life when I have an abundance. But Paul says, I have learnt this secret. Whatever season I'm in, I will be content. Except when you walk into the fly fishing shop. (laughs) Verse 12, I know how to be brought low, he says, and I know how to abound in and every circumstances. I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. What Paul is saying is, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can face prosperity, which is actually, prosperity is actually the greatest enemy to your faith. Nobody's testimony has ever sounded like this. When I was flourishing and walking in the blessings of God, I was ever so close to God. But I don't know how many times I've heard people say, I felt like I was walking through the valley of the shadow of death and Jesus was right there. What Paul says is, whether I'm shipwrecked on the Isle of Malta or whether I'm being lavished upon, I know what it is to be content. I want to finish with this story this morning, a story about, it's a fictional story, so don't try and look it up, but a fictional story about an American man that is on holiday in Mexico. And as he's walking along the beach in one of the fishing harbours, he notices that all the boats are out except for one. And he goes up to this guy and his whole boat is filled with yellow fin tuna. This guy says, how long did it take you to catch these? Eh, he says, oh, you know, two or three hours. Three hours. He says, why don't you go out and fish some more? If it's that easy, why don't you go and get some more? The Mexican guy says, he says, you know what? He says, I have enough for me and my family. He says, this is more than enough for us. This guy says, he says what do you do with all of your day? He says, well, he says, I sleep late. He says, I fish a little. He says, I play with the kids. I siesta with my wife in the evenings. He says, I walk through the village. He says, I sip wine and I play the guitar with my amigos. And if you're Mexican here, I apologize for the accent. (laughs) I look Irish. (laughs) So this man says, you know what? We can help each other out. He says, "I, I have an MBA from Harvard. And he says, if you just fish a few more hours every day, you can get more fish and you can build a bigger boat. He says, and once you've got the bigger boat, he says, you can be the one that's catching all the fish and you can drive all these other guys out of the harbour and you'll be the only guy fishing here. He says, and then after some time, we want to have the whole process. So we need you to move up to New York and we're going to build a factory and you're not only going to be catching the fish and having a fleet of boats, he says, but you're going to be canning the tuna. And then after a while, he says, we're going to list you on the stock exchange. You can sell your business. And then he says, you can sit back and relax. He says, hang on a second. He says, how long is all this going to take? He says, ah, 15 to 20 years. He says, after 20 years, he says, you'll have that much money. He says, you can sit back and relax. And the Mexican guy says, but what does that look like? He says, well, he says, you can sleep late. (laughs) He says, you can fish a little. He says, you can play with the kids and have a siesta with your wife. He says, in the evenings, you can walk through the village and sip a little wine and play the guitar with your amigos. And how many people here this morning would be like that Mexican and go, why? Why do we run after these things? Rest is Jesus. Rest is when Jesus is our more. Frightening question, particularly amongst Western Christianity. But if you lost every physical possession you have right now, if tomorrow you woke up and you didn't have any cars, you didn't have a house, 
but you had Jesus. I remember in the late 1990s, there was a bushfire in Tasmania that wiped out a little town called Dunalley. And what happened that day was, believe it or not, the Tasmanian Weather Bureau got it wrong again, but they had forecast that the wind was going to blow in one direction and it only had a very mild, but in the middle of the afternoon, a, a blaze that they had under control, the wind shifted, intensified to over 100 kilometres an hour. And the people of Denali didn't have hours to prepare, they had minutes. There are people filming what happened on their phone as they run down to the Derwent River and just jump off the jetties and just waited for hours in the Derwent River to be picked up. After that happened, a journalist is interviewing a man who is standing on the rubbles of his house. His aluminium boat had melted into a blob of aluminium and you couldn't even see what trace there was of his cars. The journalist put the microphone in front of him and said, H -h how do you feel? And he says, you know what? Strangely liberated. He says, my whole life was this house, that boat, in the cars, he says, I've got my wife and kids. He says, I've got everything. If you were standing on the rubble tomorrow, but you had Jesus. Friends, if you have everything, you have rest. If Jesus is your more, welcome to the promised land. Yeah. Let's pray. Jesus, you said, come unto me, we come. We come with open arms, just like Jonathan came. We come with open arms and surrendered hearts. And Lord, our souls long for rest, but they only rest in you. May each one of our hearts find its true rest in Jesus. In your wonderful name we pray.